Welcome to the Washington Monthly Show uh, here on Blogging Heads TV. I'm uh, Paul Glastris, Editor-in-Chief of the Washington Monthly. I'm here with uh, my partner in crime, Ed Kilgore, Chief Blogger uh, and Contributor to the Washington Monthly. We're on completely opposite sides of the United States. Um, I'm in D.C. You're on the far west coast in Monterey, California, Ed, but uh, welcome. Thanks. It's exciting to start doing this. Um, so uh, let's just, uh, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the news of the day, Some a lot of breaking news, a lot of big things happening on a Monday in July, and then in a little while we're going to talk to um, Nicholas Confessori of the New York Times, who's been covering the money and politics beat at the mostly the presidential level this year with great distinction, and uh, Nick is a contributing editor of the Washington Monthly, an old friend of the organization, so we'll, uh, we're will we looking forward to that. But Ed, I wanted to just um, ask you about the the big news of today, which is the, the announcement by Scott Walker, governor of Wisconsin, that he is in fact in the race. Um, it was a delayed announcement because Scott Walker had to uh, get some uh, house uh, cleaning done, some pass his budget in the state. What did you make uh, of his announcement? And and do you share, I guess, my belief that he really is the guy to beat? Well, it's a little early to, to uh, put odds on anybody, but yes, I think he's a very formidable candidate. Uh, if I had to make a bet right now, my money would probably be on him. Um, it's been a much delayed announcement because he really had to get out of a very difficult legislative session where he was fighting with a lot of Republicans, by the way. I guess the good news for him is that he burnished his, uh, you know, I hate liberals and I hate unions uh, reputation with uh, a budget that not only cut higher education for that uh, funding, including that famous liberal institution, the University of Wisconsin in Madison, but also uh, tried to, to took tenure rights for um, college professors out of state law. Uh, so that will he can add that to his resume of uh, labor bashing and liberal bashing. Um, he starts uh, the campaign a little late. Um, he's lost a little bit of standing in a lot of the national polls over the last month. We've been told that he's been boning up on policy uh, because he's he needs it, <laughs> uh, and he he did make a few flubs uh, early in the um, in the going uh, in the invisible primary. But I'm pretty sure right now for Team Walker, the only thing that really matters is that he has maintained a dominant position in Iowa, uh, the first in the nation caucus state. Um, he sort of jumped into the lead back in February after a very well-received speech, uh, and it's a kind of an ideal state for him. So I think uh, I don't know that he even he and his people even care uh, who's on top uh, in the horse race national polls. Uh, I don't think he cares that he's now behind Donald Trump in those. He's looking good in Iowa, and I think his entire strategy depends on winning in Iowa decisively and then moving on from there. Uh, in a lot of ways, the Walker campaign is, is sort of a test of what Republicans call the Buckley rule, which is that you want to nominate the most conservative candidate available who you think can win, the most, uh, most conservative electable candidate. And everything Walker's been doing is to position himself as exactly that. Yeah, that, I think that's very well said. And, and a, as you know, we published a big piece by Don Kettle of the uh, University of Maryland, who uh, was for many years at the University of Wisconsin and a close observer of Wisconsin politics, a profile of Scott Walker that I thought made a pretty good case that the single most important aspect of his governing, the his calling card really for conservatives and as a presidential candidate, is his having busted the private, the public sector, primarily unions. He also uh, got a right to work law passed, but 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 taking away co essentially all most or all collective bargaining uh, powers from most of the public sector unions in Wisconsin is the thing that's really uh, made him a hero among Republicans. No other candidate can really really holds that ground. 
Um, and, you know, you add to that, and, and the other aspect of it, and I wanted to just sort of get your sense of this, is he claims not only to have been able to bust the, the unions, but to do it and survive electorally. He was essentially re-elected. Uh, he also beat out a recall election. Um, is it your sense that that's a claim that kind of goes to the Buckley rule, right? Uh, I, I'm not only yeah. conservative, but I, I've succeeded politically. I've been reelected uh, yeah. that, despite that. Yeah, I, I mean, the conventional wisdom has always been that, uh, you know, more moderate candidates are electable. Uh, that's one of the uh, arguments you'll get for why uh, an increasingly conservative party nominated John McCain in 2008 and Mitt Romney in 2012. Um, but that logic drives conservatives absolutely crazy. Uh, they hate the idea that you have to compromise on your principles or your ideology in order to win elections. And the defeat of two relatively moderate candidates in the last two cycles has really fed the conservative claim, and there's a similar claim on the left for that matter, that no, you don't move to the center to win, you 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 uh, you stand on your principles, you energize your base, you, uh, you end up becoming more conservative, not less. Yeah, I'm not hearing you too well here. Ed. You're, 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 cut, you're cutting in and out a little bit, but... Um, um, you know, in a simple numerical... Uh, it's a simple arithmetic formula, uh, four, three, two. He's won, excuse me, three, four, two. Walker has won three elections in the last four years in a state that Barack Obama carried two times. That's his big electability claim. Yeah, but let me ask you a question uh, about that. He did so uh, not in years that Barack Obama yeah. was on the ticket, right? He did the, these are all, yeah. I guess, non presidential elections where Republicans. Right, two, midterm, two midterms and one special election. Right, right. So doesn't but, that sort of yeah. undermine his argument? Uh, isn't it kind of transparently well, it, it not could. the case that he he can I mean, he, he win? It. I mean, some argue he couldn't have won re-election in a, in a, had he run against Barack Obama in 2012. Well, let me put it this way. Uh, I've been arguing now since about 2011. I even wrote a book uh, heavily uh, around this theme that there are two electorates in the country now, one in midterms, one in presidential races, uh, Midterms benefit Republicans, presidential years benefit Democrats, yet I'd say two-thirds of the political pundits out there just really don't get it, uh, really don't understand the distinction or why it matters. So I think maybe um, Scott Walker is going to benefit from, frankly, ignorance. Uh, you know, as far as most Republican voters know, here's a guy that won in a liberal, famously liberal state three times in the last four years. That's all the proof they need. Besides, most Republicans don't really want to hear that uh, the advantage they had in 2014 demographically could turn into a disadvantage in 2016. So that's news from nowhere. Um, right. right. Anyway, the, the biggest peril that uh, Walker faces uh, in making this case is, frankly, general election polls in Wisconsin showing him losing to Hillary Clinton. Right. And there have already been a couple of those. So we'll, that's yeah. something to keep your eyes on. Well, there's also the money question, and I want to ask Nick Confessori about that when yeah. we bring him on. Now, before we do bring on Nick, I wanted to bring one other subject uh, to bear here, and that is, you know, we're right in the middle of uh, the, the battle, uh, the negotiations in Europe over whether Greece... Uh, is or is not going to be bailed out and uh, kept within the uh, European Currency Union. Um, I think there's just, I, I've been reading uh, feverishly the breaking news and trying to figure out on my, by myself what I think about all this, but rather than belabor the details of it, I wanted to ask you um, whether you think the Greek situation, the European situation with Greece, is something that's going to figure in, in one way or another, to U.S. presidential and uh, uh, and other uh, campaigns. And the reason I think that that's might be the case is I recall you recall in 2012, Mitt Romney fit into his uh, 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 basic uh, stump speech 
a few lines saying he didn't, we don't want America to be like Greece. Um, he even criticized uh, uh, Barack Obama for doing an, a, a, an event in front of Grecian columns and, uh, uh, and uh, talked about the liberal press as the Greek chorus. Now, as you know, Ed, I'm a proud Greek American, and that kind of get my, got my dander up a little bit, but it also made me kind of recognize that there's some similarities between the politics of Europe right now and the politics yeah. of the United States, and I thought I just might throw that out there and get your quick reaction. Well, uh, some of the Republican presidential candidates uh, have been using Greece again, this year uh, is an is is like the sort of demonic example of what the United States will become if Democrats remain in power. I think Bobby Jindal's it's it's become part of his stump speech. As a matter of fact, so we're going to hear more of that kind of talk. I think uh, at a deeper level, uh, I suspect the whole situation in Europe uh, and Greece is going to become uh, part of the symbolic rhetorical hardware, probably of both parties. Uh, in the United States. I mean, frankly, what's this has always been sort of in the background in our two major parties, but I think it's gotten really uh, more evident after the financial crisis and the Great Recession. The Republican Party, by and large, uh, identifies with creditors, and the Democratic Party tends to identify with debtors uh, in, in that great divide of, of, of sympathies. I mean, you may recall that uh, the standard conservative take on the the uh, the housing and financial meltdown and the ensuing recession that it was really caused by poor and minority people buying houses they couldn't afford. Uh, you know, which ruined the financial system. Then they had to come to government for a bailout. It, it, it's a standard morality play, and when you look at the um, Republican demographic constituency right now, an extraordinarily high percentage of self-identified Republicans are older white people, many living on a fixed income, but doing quite well, weren't really affected much by the recession at all. It's classic predator mentality. They'd like to see hard money. They'd like to see as little, little or no inflation. And they don't really have any kind of sympathy for people that are uh, struggling to, to make ends meet because they've already kind of made it. Right. Yeah. And then and one could just see the parallels <laughs> right across the pond, as they say. Yeah. So so um, let's bring on Nick Confessori, the New York Times. Nick, are you with us? I am. Nick, welcome to the Washington Monthly Show. Good to talk Good to, to you. Good to be here. Um, so, uh, Nick, uh, you had an extraordinary piece in the New York Times on Saturday, this previous Saturday, uh, datelined Kenna Bunkport and... Uh, uh, it was about the uh, Bush family compound there um, bringing a lot of uh, uh, donors uh, in about uh, uh, having a, a kind of a reunion of the Bush universe at the the kind of sacred uh, uh, spawning grounds of the of the Bush dynasty and uh tell us a little bit about uh about your experiences there and uh what you found well you know it was my first trip uh to kenny bunkport um people who have covered the white house uh under the past bush presidencies uh have been there before from the times uh so i had some good uh you know recommendations for restaurants um but basically i was there to try to capture this moment where where Jeb Bush, who has kind of uh, been awkward about exactly how you know, tightly to embrace the family name, you know, really embrace it in a big way. There wasn't any of this temporizing. There was none of this, you know, bumper stickers without his last name on them. You know, this is not a place where people are talking about the downsides of the Bush family name, talking about the Iraq war, talking about how Jeb Bush has seemed uncomfortable uh, with embracing his family heritage. This is a place where a Bush can be a Bush. This is a place where the family is revered, where they've had a home for over a century, uh, where everybody there is sort of a fan. Uh, and that was kind of the setting that he chose to gather his donors um, on a day when they were ready to announce that uh, his campaign and the Super PAC backing him had raised more money than anyone ever had so quickly, over $100 million. Uh, which was an amazing total for them. So it was sort of both 
a celebration, but also for the younger Bush donors and bundlers, the people who hadn't worked for his brother or his dad. It was sort of an initiation into Bush world. Hmm. The P generation, you called them. That's the right. Peas right? crowd. Peas crowd. And in fact, I, I did see quite a few people who were in their 30s and 40s, uh, men and women. Uh, it's hard to know if they're representative of the total group or not, uh, but there was certainly a lot of them there. And P, uh, P, on being, and P being George P. Bush. George P. Bush is is the uh, son of Jeb. Uh, he's run for office in Texas. Uh, he has a national political action committee called Maverick Pack, which is sort of a younger Republican pack. Uh, and it seems like he has brought in a new generation of Bush donors. Well, that was uh, a, a question, Ed, you had about uh, for Nick, I think, about who, who these donors are. Yeah, uh, I mean, famously, the 2004 George W. Bush re-election campaign was sort of a world-class bundling effort. Uh, and, and the people that were involved in, in that were very, very proud of it. Um, and early on in the uh, invisible primary, there was a lot of talk about those people getting back together to help Jeb. But bundling is all about collecting money in the small amounts uh, require, you know, allowed under the campaign finance regulations for official campaigns. But apparent, but a, I believe close to ninety percent of the money uh, Team Jeb announced uh, on that day it was actually Super PAC money. So, how do bundlers get involved in Super PAC fundraising? It's a good question. It's going to be hard to answer it until the super PACs have to report to the SEC, which won't be for about two weeks. Uh, so we don't okay. know a lot uh, that's comprehensive about the identities of the donors to either of these campaigns or to the super PACs. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, we sort of have some ideas based on invitations to events, uh, to fundraisers for both the campaigns and the super PACs. Um, so I think, look, there are a fair number of people who served under George W. Bush or even George H.W. Um, I saw a bunch of those people uh, in, in Kenny Bunkport. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen their names on invitations. These are people who were ambassadors or appointees uh, of, of George W. Bush or George H.W. Bush, uh, people who were friendly or raised money for Jeb Bush when he was Florida governor. Um, but also I think some, some newer folks uh, who have just decided to get behind Jeb. I'm just not going to be able to answer that question in the comprehensive way that I would like until we can actually get into those names and compare them to past campaigns. Okay. That's, that's fair enough. So perhaps uh, a lot of the people you saw up there who were the pioneers of 2004 may not be quite as big a part of the um, Jeb Bush financial picture as you might imagine, but they were, but they're part of the family. So, so they're there, right? I think so. I mean, You'll find that uh, uh, there are some super PAC donors who, who do not do bundling. It's two different things, as you point yeah. out. The bundlers are people who make hundreds and hundreds of phone calls over the course of a year and a half. It's a lot of work. Um, they tend to be people who have already made a living, already retired or semi-retired, and they can spend a day or two a week doing this full time. Uh, uh, and the super PAC donors are often people who only give to super PACs. So it's very easy. You, you know, it, it, it takes only a check. Um, to be a part of a super PAC. Uh, yeah. So it's very different. It's very different. Um, but there is some overlap. There are people who raise money but also cut checks for super PACs. And it'll be very, it'll, it'll be very interesting to see, you know, how big is the super PAC donor community uh, in this world? We know uh, for a fact that Jeb Bush's super PAC said it had raised uh, contributions of $25,000 or less from about 9,000 donors. Uh, which is a big chunk, and that suggests there is a fairly large universe, the super PAC equivalent of small donors uh, that they are tapping into here. <laughs> right, right. Hey, now, Nick, um, give me a sense of whether raising $100 million uh, for your super PAC plus, I don't know, 20, 30 million, 15 million for your campaign, which is a, it's the super PAC number probably four times bigger than the next candidate out there, whether that is a, a big deal or not? Uh, what we've seen so far 
with, with this campaign is a real uh, switch in how money is raised and apportioned in politics. Um, the last campaign, you basically would have these big uh, uh, campaigns and then a smaller, a, you know, a large but a smaller super PAC on the side. The super PAC would be a vehicle for, for, for media, for paid media, um, uh, and everything else would be handled by the campaign. Uh, you know, Romney, if you compared uh, Mitt Romney and a super PAC, over half of the money raised between them in the primary was raised by Romney's campaign. This time it's all backwards. The super PACs in almost every case are raising two to three to four times more than the candidates' campaign committees. In a lot of cases, because the candidates were doing that fundraising themselves personally before they formally declared their candidates and were thus barred. Right, which which means that they're they're, coor- they're coordinating like crazy, but they're only they're able to coordinate because they're not yet announced candidates, right? Well, so they argue, and there's some dispute over the legality of that, and we're not going to really have an answer because the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, uh, is is gridlocked, and there's a hard it's it's hard to know uh, how far they can push this in terms of the, the law and the rules. But what we have seen is that. Essentially, most of the money being raised in, in the primary on the Republican side is being raised into these super PACs, which suggests that the super PACs are going to pick up a lot of the cost of the duties of, of the actual campaigning cycle. So, yeah, so you're saying they're going to pick up a lot of the cost of the basic campaigning, and that's like lists and ground stuff as well as um, sort of TV commercials, right? Yeah, you'll see, you'll see examples of... Uh, uh, a super PAC announcing a forum with a candidate. The super PAC pays for the forum, organizes the voters, invites people. Uh, the candidate sees the announcement and shows up. Right. Um, and that's a way of, of outsourcing that costs to the super PAC. And of course, the reason for this is the super PAC can raise unlimited contributions uh, from corporations, individuals, and labor unions, whereas the, the, the candidate's own committee can only raise 2700 for the primary election from each individual and no corporate or, or labor money at all. So, so, so you're outsourcing so, your costs to the entity that can bring in the most money with the least cost of doing business. So in terms of what people are going to see in the course of the next year, doesn't that mean that we're going to have a whole, as we did last year, or last cycle, last presidential cycle, a whole lot of candidates who have all the money they need for their campaigns because all they're really doing is paying for staff and a, and a, and a pickup truck or a limousine and some cell phones. And as long as they've got super PACs, they can stay in the race um, whether they're picking up uh, uh, primary voters or not. And so uh, we we're, the, the sort of multiple multiplicity of, of candidates that uh, we're seeing now and saw in 2012, we're going to see more of. Is that Do I have that right? That's right. Uh, you know, uh, some strategists have pointed out to me that essentially, you know, somebody's campaign could be in the doghouse, uh, uh, you know, struggling in a lot of different ways. And a candidate can have one good winner with a big winner, uh, get a huge infusion of cash and have a second bite at the apple. So, you know, you imagine someone like Carly Fiorina, uh, she would have had to self-fund her campaign in any other era. Um uh, you know, uh, Rick Perry, for example, uh, coming in as a, as a third tier guy this time after his flubs in 2012, he only raised a million dollars for his campaign. His super PAC has raised, his two super PACs, I should say, have raised $17 million. So think about that. Now, his is probably the most extreme disproportionality between the outside money from the allied PACs and with the campaign. But you can basically kind of uh, kind of lever yourself up into the second tier financially, but just a couple of big contributions. Let me ask a, a one quick follow-up question about that, Nick, about the strategic side of this. We heard early on in the Invisible Primary that Jeb Bush intended to run an upbeat, positive campaign. Uh, yet more recently, we've heard that his super PAC may be uh, launching some pretty vicious personal attacks on his rivals. Uh the thing that really stood out in my mind is that we had an indication that uh, his old buddy, Marco Rubio, they might go after him about his personal finances. So uh, my question is, do you get the sense that Team Bush thinks that a super PAC will enable them to go negative without uh, the candidate himself being blamed? And is, could that possibly be true? 
Uh, I'm certain of it. I think all of the candidates look at it that way. way. Um, uh, you know, a person watching the ad is going to see a forgettable Super PAC name. All the names are designed to sound the same, by the way. Uh, right to Rise, Make Us Great Again, Unintimidated. It's just sort of hard to keep them straight, and that's the idea. You want voters to not really have a, a sense of where the attacks are coming from. So for, for certain candidates, especially one who's already quite well known and has a high name ID like Jeb Bush, you'll mostly see uh, the super PACs as an attack vehicle, although the Bush super PAC headed by Republican consultant Mike Murphy has also said they plan to do a lot of positive advertising. I think for some of the other candidates who are less well known, like perhaps a Scott Walker, you'll see the super PACs essentially taking on the job of introducing voters to the candidate and the record because uh, they can raise the money that it'll, it'll take to run these big ad campaigns. It's very expensive to get name ID up by sheer force of advertising, but these super PACs can do it. I think we'll see both is a short answer. And let me ask one more follow-up question, and that is that uh, uh, you mentioned Scott Walker. Is he going to raise, and, and, and I sort of asked you this earlier, that, that $100 million dollars, how big a deal is that? Scott Walker's got maybe, what is it, $20 million now in his super PAC and a, maybe an equivalent amount in his campaign. Um, is Scott Walker, what kind of a disadvantage, I guess is my question, what kind of a disadvantage is Scott Walker at? What kind of an advantage is Jeb Bush at? at? When you get to these kinds of numbers, $20, 30000000 million, um, does another $50 million uh, give you a decisive edge? Uh, uh, or not? Uh, that's a great question. I think we're going to find out. There's a, just a lot more money in the campaign so far than you would ever have even thought uh, uh, four years ago. The, uh, there are so many more candidates that are well capitalized for the race. Um, I think uh, a Scott Walker or uh, a Rubio or, or you know, a variety of the first or second tier candidates you know, believe, and probably rightly, that they can just get about forty to fifty million dollars between all their different entities. They're going to have, money, you know, have enough money to compete through the start of the primaries. And the real worry here is that someone like Jeb Bush is, is going to have enough money to just bludgeon them all fall before the first vote is even counted. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. I think there's just too much money. Too many candidates are financially equipped to fend off attacks and mount attacks of their own. Well, isn't that a, a, you know an argument? against campaign limits, right? If, 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 we, if what you have with Citizens United is enough people get enough money that somebody else with more money can't really undo their capacity to compete, um, isn't that a, a sign that maybe taking off the limits is a good thing? Yeah, it's certainly an argument you hear. Uh, uh, and one argument, yeah, is that campaigns are more competitive you could say that was true in 2012 when Newt Gingrich and Rick Santorum had the ability to really prolong the nominating fight because of super PACs. However, I think there's evidence already that this is not so much the case here. If you took away super PAC money right now from this campaign, you'd have basically three candidates more or less tied for money, Rubio, Cruz, and Bush. Sorry, uh, Perry. Sorry, Rubio, Cruz, and Bush, each with about uh, um, 11 to $15 million. You'd have uh, you know, Rand Paul not too far behind with $7 million, and then a few people at the million to $2 million range. It would be much more tightly banded, and I think, therefore, much more competitive if you didn't have super PACs. If you stack these guys up on what we call hard money, their campaign money, they're actually a lot more evenly matched. It's only when we bring in the super PACs that someone like Bush can get up to multiples, you know, kind of double the next nearest person. Of money, well, so I'm so so my my hatred of Citizens United remains okay. I think it probably can, and just think it's not always, uh, you know, competition is one you know goal, especially for deregulators in the campaign finance world. It's not the only value, um, and if these candidates are much expensive, I'm sorry, these candidates are much more dependent on their super PACs than ever before. That by definition means they're also much more dependent on the donors who can finance these super PACs. And that is not just the 1%, it's the 0.001% of the 1%. It is a tiny number of people that can pay for these things. Mm. So, uh, 
I would just add one little point that the political scientists always like to talk about. In presidential races, general election money, as long as it's not disproportionately in one direction or another, kind of cancels itself out and isn't that important. They have to raise the money, but it, it rarely really matters. But in primaries, it matters a great deal. Is, is that sort of the gospel you've heard, Nick? Uh, you know, I, I think it does matter, but I think there are a lot of other factors. I mean, one, one issue we've always had uh, with political science uh, is that it's very hard to create a proper natural experiment for money yeah. in politics. Um, there are a lot of things that are commonplaces in political journalism about, about campaign finance, cash, and influence that are hard to prove empirically. Um, but I think any uh, political scientist would also tell you we haven't really had a good opportunity to prove any of them. Um, it's just very difficult to design an experiment that can essentially uh, sort out and isolate money as the limiting factor in an experiment. Interesting. Right? Interesting. Very hard to do. And so it's almost impossible to prove either way empirically. That may change in the future. Future, but that is kind of you know a, a major frustration I think with the social science on this. Well, Nick, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, ask you one final question, and it's pure. A pure I'm going to just a sort of pure horse race question, which is not the Washington Monthly way, as you know. But I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, who do you think is better uh, suited, set up to go the distance in the Republican primary? Is it is it uh, is it Rubio? Is it Bush? Is it Walker? Who who who, if you had to predict now, will come through this with the brass ring? Well, I've been saying for months that I feel like Walker has the most upside. Um, uh, you know, this guy who somehow managed to, to win three elections in a purple state running as a conservative, um, as a pretty conservative candidate. So he's doing something right. Um, uh, he's won in a swing state. It's more than and become essentially sophisticated enough and have enough depth on policy to convince people he's presidential material, uh, I just think he has a lot of upside. I think someone like Bush has mostly downside. Uh, I don't think he has the record or the, or the history with the modern GOP and its modern grassroots, the post Tea Party grassroots. I just don't think he has a lot of credibility there to fall back on. He has to build it. I think his family name is a hindrance as well as a help when it comes to fundraising. Um, and Rubio, I think, as well, a lot of upside. Uh, you do hear a lot about the, uh, you know, the opposition research binders uh, on Marco Rubio that have been floating around uh, GOP several years, uh, uh, and we can imagine issues about his personal finances, his use of state and party credit cards. All those issues will come to light. I think Rubio is just one of the least vetted candidates. <laughs> right. Uh, so. I've got to say, I think that, that, that Scott Walker is, is highly vetted. He's been through a lot. He wins every time. And I think that counts for something, even if it's hard to put our fingers in, in, a, in a robust way on exactly what that is. Uh, well said. I, 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 I in total agreement with you. I, he, I sort of identified him as the, uh, for some of the same reasons, but I think you've, you, you, you make a very good case that the, on the vetting and, and, um, the the record of winning and and uh, he, he certainly uh, you know my my biggest uh, uh, my sense is he's the one that that will go the distance. Um, I want well, to thank. I, I have to I have to interject here that he's also to three elections in four years without running a president or a cycle. So um, that's my answer to his. Uh, an electoral record in Wisconsin. He's running in non-presidential elections where Republicans have an advantage. But hey, if uh, if, if primary voters buy it, but that proves he's electable in a in a presidential election, more power to him. Yeah, I think I think they probably will. Uh, Ed Kilgore of the Washington Monthly's Political Animal Blog, Nick Confessori of the New York Times. Uh, thank you both, and um, Nick, I hope you'll join us again on the uh, Washington Monthly show. Sure time. Sure thing. All right. Talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.